One of these people are you. You've had a long day at school. Or was it the office? Five. Now you are home. Ah. Relax. Maybe you want to watch television. You've heard it all before, haven't you? You feel a mixture of sorrow and cynicism. The world is richer than it has ever been, and yet there seems to be more poor people than ever. You are falling asleep. You're going to have a strange dream. It starts with this thought. If we want to make poverty history, then first we need to understand the history of poverty. Your dream starts in a library full of floating books. There are voices that seem to come from the books and speak to you. You are a prehistoric girl or boy, you choose, and this is your family. Dad doesn't have a car, mom doesn't have a fridge, and you don't have an iPod. But there are plenty of wild animals. So you are trying to work out if you are rich or poor at the start of human history. At least everyone seems equal. You're hungry. So dad gets dinner. The mood of your dream changes. The ice age has come and you don't have central heating in your cave. So you get frozen very quickly. Perfectly preserved for a future museum exhibit titled Poor Man. So much for poverty in the Stone Age. With no food or medicine, you died before you could find out much about it. Now your soul floats over the world's early civilization. See all the millions of little farmers with their little fields and little huts. Everything looks poor except for the one or two palaces where the kings and chiefs, the billionaires of ancient history, lived. Time has moved on thousands of years. This is an amphitheater in ancient Greece. You have come to see a famous play, but you can't afford the price of a ticket, so you watch it through the gaps in the gates. It's about a Greek god called poverty. Who are you? Oh, you're terrible. I'm poverty. I've lived amongst you for so many years. Oh, great Apollo. Oh, ye gods. How can I escape? Oh, it's poverty. The most evil monster that ever breathed upon the earth. We shall drive, drive you out of Greece. Greece. Drive me, poverty, out of Greece. That would be disaster for humanity. If wealth is distributed to everyone equally, then no one will ever work hard again. No one will want to make clothes or shoes, lay bricks, plow the fields, or gather the harvest. You're talking crap, because everything on your list will be done by slaves, of course. Yes, but if everyone was rich, no one would want to engage in the dirty business of selling slaves. You feel disheartened. You were hoping to learn how to escape poverty. Instead, they said, So, now you know you are going to be poor for a long, long time. But history has a new concept that can help you. Charity. All the world's religions offer it. But which one has the best deal? You find yourself bang in the middle of the Middle Ages and the Middle East. In a strange room, 
there are planks of wood, saws, hammers, and menorah. You must be a Jewish carpenter. You start barricading the door. But why? You aren't that poor yet, but you might be. You owe money in taxes. Soldiers might arrest you. Then how would you and your family survive? A single act of charity closes 70 gates of evil. The only gift is giving to the poor. All else is exchange. The wise one, rejoicing in charity, becomes thereby happy in the beyond. So you begin to write a letter to your local rabbi. I've never asked for money from anyone, but I have debts owed to Muslims. I'm in hiding. I'm watching my children and my old mother starve. I throw myself before God and you to help me. Save me from the tax collectors. And you step into a different world. 200 years on in time. Now you have nothing. Just a bad leg and a crutch. You are a beggar in a sea of beggars. There are thousands here like you. Beggars in the church. You are attending a funeral, but neither you nor any of the other poor people here knew the man who died. What's important is that you have heard he was minted, one of the richest landowners around. There is a sermon. Let all the brothers strive to follow the poverty of our Lord Jesus Christ, and let them rejoice when they find themselves among the poor the weak, the sick, and those who beg. Don't say that, you think to yourself. Or everyone will want to try this lifestyle. Too late. The crowd has doubled in size, and it is full of monks in robes, begging like you. At last, money left by the rich nobleman is being handed out by the priests. Make sure you get some before it runs out. And look at yourself now. You are the ruler of a Latin American civilization, the Incas. You were rich, but you are about to become poor, faster than anyone else in history. The era of colonialism has begun. The Spanish have conquered your country. If you fill this room with gold, they won't kill you, so they say. Now you have been put in prison. You see your people are dying. The colonizers brought new diseases with them. Influenza, syphilis, that are killing half your people. The Inca emperor has his own dream within your dream. The world does not look like it does today. Europe is not yet much richer than anywhere else. You wonder how all that changed. Latin America offers a clue. European colonizers are laying the foundations of modern poverty. You look through the clouds at Africa, trying to see if they are hungry yet. Iron ring around your neck. You, the emperor of the Incas, are being executed. The technical term for this painful death is garote. See? And you feel yourself falling, then crawling through the center of the world. You emerge on the other side, in China. A young girl in a huge field. Dry Nothing can grow here. Dry there could be a famine. And yet you feel safe in China. You have been saved from death by famine. Lucky you are not in the West, but in the East. 
In a well-governed country, poverty is something to be ashamed of. In a badly governed country, wealth is something to be ashamed of. You are on a cart, with all your family's belongings piled high. The start of a new journey for you. Your father tells you that he is fed up with the pre-modern poverty and scraping a living off the land. He sold his little farm to a big landowner for a few coins. And all your neighbors' daddies have done the same. You are a 12-year-old cloth worker. You spin wool with a hundred other boys. The bus stops you and points to the door. There is no work for you anymore. War has disrupted your markets. Your factory cannot deliver the yarn to the weavers. You pass the street workers of your city, the chimney sweeps, matchbox sellers, beggars, and prostitutes. You're scared. The important people in top hats have a new way of helping the poor. The workhouse is a machine for grinding rogues honest. It's after the workhouse for you. As you pass through the doorway, your body changes. Your hair grows long, chest expands. There is a big bump on your stomach. And now you enter a dining room full of thin, hungry little boys. Something reminds you of a book you once read. The boys are being served a horrid looking soup. One of them, perhaps he is your son stands up and walks up to the man in charge and holds up his bowl and says, Please, sir, I want some more. Blimey, he wants more. The rich often seem to want to help the poor, but it never seems to change the system. Ahead of you, you see Karl Marx, the founder of communism. You ask him, why are the rich getting richer, but not me? The rich will do anything for the poor, except stop exploiting them. Karl is nice and makes you a cup of tea. You tell him, I want to rise out of poverty, but how can I do this? Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. You look around for the revolutionary industrial proletariat that Uncle Carl told you about, but you find yourself swept along in a different kind of crowd. Thousands of peasants and freed slaves are going up into the mountains of Brazil. Now you are a follower, a follower of a renegade preacher, Antonio Conciliero, whose teachings combine Christianity, communism, free love, and of course, the end of the world. The reign of God is nigh. He will descend in majesty, cast down the mighty and exalt the sufferers, the poor, his poor. Two years later, and you have a new home in a new city of the poor. 30,000 people live here. Quick, man the barricades of the city. Your rifle is old and rusty, and you are under attack from the Brazilian army. There are 10,000 troops with machine guns, and yet their bullets can't kill you. You find the real revolutionary proletariat. You strike, you protest, you fight. So, comrades, come on and rally. 
across the world you overthrow governments, though sometimes you have to settle for equal rights and higher wages. You are on your way up in the West. The government builds sewers and installs water pipes. Sanitation is better than revolution. You're on top of the world again. But time has moved forward to present day. You look down and you can see the same things you saw in Europe and America. Now in India, China, Latin America. There are industrial zones, modern hospitals, apartment blocks, and team parks. You toss and turn in your sleep. You think while few people are starving, there is still a massive underclass servicing the rich. Why are they still there? You want an answer. You are on the palm trees, and beyond the tall mountains lies the glittering ocean. In the distance, there are some things you have never seen before. It's a busy market and you are selling cloth. People are paying you in beautiful shells. These are what you have used for centuries as money. Every time you sell a garment, you put more shells in your jar. Then the colonial police arrive. They don't like your money. Look, your skin has turned a shade of brown. You are in a camp somewhere else. A month ago, you were a starving Indian farmer. But now, you are a starving forced labor. Plus, you have cholera, which is bad news. A train goes past on the new railway built by the British. A cloud floats off it. A cloud of wheat, something to eat. You realize the train is full of grain destined for export. Poverty is the worst form of violence. You serve alcohol to the poor black workers of South Africa. Once they were farmers, but the white man took their land away. By day, they go down to the mines. In the evening, they talk about a system that made them poor because of the color of their skin. Look into the glass into which you are pouring a bottle of homebrew. Images flow through it of the coming 30 years of history. There are swarms of tanks, bombing raids, concentration camps, then happier images. New flags are flying, black people cheer. Oh, you look different. You are wearing a dress of expensive fabric and surrounded by men in suits. You are no longer poor. Instead, you are the future leader of a poor country. You've come to hear a speech. More than half the people of the world are living in conditions approaching misery. Their poverty is a handicap and a threat both to them and to more prosperous areas. For the first time in history, humanity possesses the knowledge and skill to relieve the suffering of these people. A new chapter in the history of poverty is beginning. The world is now divided into rich countries and poor countries. The rich countries at long last admit they have to help the poor ones. Oh, a lift. Press the highest button. The roof is like an airport. Planes are flying overhead and helicopters are taking off with full cargoes of air. 
There are loads of new seeds and medicines. The helicopters blow a strong wind that drives you backwards towards the elevator. This time there are only two buttons. China and Africa. You press the China button. You join a queue on a giant communal farm. In time for Chairman Mao's great leap forward. Poverty gives rise to desire for change, desire for action, desire for revolution. Look down at your hands. You are holding pots and pans and metal farming implements. Everyone else's hands are holding the same thing. Ahead is a big fire. Nothing left to cook with, but that's okay because there's nothing to eat anyway. If only you had pressed the button in the elevator marked Africa. And there it is again. Run for it. Press the other button. You are shown to a seat at a big table. A black man, surrounded by white businessmen. They all address you as Mr. President. They want to help you build factories in your young country, which they say will make your people rich. One man says, first, you have to build the biggest dam in the world. Then another says, we will help you by lending you millions of dollars. All you have to do is promise to pay it back at a huge rate of interest. Soldiers have come into your offices and they are forcing you to flee. You are chased. As you run, you see terrible sights. There are children with Kalashnikovs, amputations, rapes, massacres, famines. There are ever greater contrasts. Slums spreading outwards and skyscrapers zooming upwards. Refugees fleeing across bridges and highways, packed with new cars. Oceans full of container ships, camps full of starving families. You go down to take a closer look. You are appearing in a TV game show. It's called, Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? The host chats to the first competitor. She's a lady from Bangladesh who borrowed money from a microfinance bank at low rates of interest, which she used to invest in her street star. And now, she runs a supermarket. Lula, the ex-president of Brazil. He was born into poverty, and he had some ideas about how to help others out of it. Then the host chats to you, the contestant from China. Your name is Zhang Qinghao. You were a poor farm laborer who went to the city and started selling ice lollies. And in 20 years, you built that up into China's largest drinks company with a drink called Future Cola. And now, the question for you on which the billion dollar prize rests. What reduces poverty today? Is it A, A, B, communism, C, state spending, or D, globalization? It's still so difficult to decide. But you go for globalization. The host says that is the correct. But before he can finish his sentence, a riot erupts across the TV set. Bolivian farmers are protesting that their water supply has been sold off to a private corporation. There is a very long queue in front of an embassy. You want a visa. You fill out a form that goes on and on. 
page after page. You give the form to a man who tears it up in your face. <laughs> and now you are on an endless ocean, in a tiny boat. You are escaping from your poor country to a rich country. But as you look down, you see that the ocean is full of banknotes, flowing from your homeland towards the place where you are going. And now you find you have that job in a rich country, in a rich company, an auction house. But you're just an unpaid intern. Your job is to carry out the paintings at the auction. This one is Edvard Munch's The Scream. The bidding is running into tens of millions. Every time the auctioneer brings down his hammer, you hear the painting scream and see another apocalyptic future. World recession, global warming, a virus with no cure. And then you wake up. It was only a dream. It's time to get up and go out. You walk out the front door. You are walking down a street, in a modern city, amidst a crowd. They are marching. You turn a corner. You see a house. It's my house. Your house. These are all the things you own. And this is your mirror. My mirror, my mirror. And it's like a moment from a dream. Except it's real. And now you are poor. I'm 